Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a radio show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I am your host, Isaac Longworth, and today's saint is actually one of my favorite saints of all time. I took him as my patron saint at my confirmation. I really love this saint. I have a great relationship with him. And so I hope that you'll like him as much as I do. Uh, but if not, that's okay. Uh, this saint was an undercover priest who ministered the sacraments in secret. He traveled all over his country in disguise in the midst of an anti-Catholic persecution in order to get the sacraments to the underground church. So he was kind of like a Catholic Robin Hood, always going around in different disguises, serving the poor. Who is he? The saint of today is Saint Edmund Campion. Saint Edmund Campion, my patron saint, one of my favorites of all time. And this first half of the show is going to look at his life to see how Edmund became a saint, what he did in his life. And then we're going to close by talking about what we can learn from his example in order to become saints ourselves, following in his example. So who is Edmund Campion? Well, Edmund was born into a Catholic family in London, England in the year 1540. Growing up, everyone thought that he was a brilliant child. He was recognized as such from an early age. And so he was sent on for further studies at really good schools until eventually at the age of only 17, he was appointed as a junior fellow at Oxford University, the famous Oxford University in England. So he's a bright guy. And while he was at Oxford, he continued to impress people. He earned two different degrees and he was acting as a tutor during this time. Now, in order for us to understand what happened next in his life, we need to understand a little bit of the backstory of what was happening in England during this time. Earlier, the King of England named King Henry VIII had declared himself the head of the Church of England. And this would become what we now know as the Anglican or the Church of England. This is where it started was when King Henry VIII declared himself the head of the church in defiance of the Pope. There was a bunch of reasons why he did this. The main one is that the Pope would not approve of the king who wanted to divorce his wife and remarry. The Pope said he couldn't do that, but King Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife, which he did. And then in order to show that he was in authority, he said, I'm in charge of the church in England, not the Pope. And so under the reign of King Henry VIII, Catholics were forced to swear allegiance to him instead of the Pope. They would have to take what was called an oath of submission, acknowledging that the king was the head of the church. And those who didn't do this were persecuted through different ways. Some of them were tortured. Some of them had their property confiscated. Catholics were taxed more than Anglicans. Uh, and several Catholics were put to death. Monasteries were sacked and all of their uh, property was taken and forfeited to the crown, so it was a really dark time for Catholics in England. Well, King Henry VIII had a daughter who ascended to the throne of England after him, and her name was Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth I. So she had taken the throne, and Queen Elizabeth followed in her father's footsteps. She was an Anglican. She saw herself as the head of the church in England, and she continued to persecute Catholics in order to strengthen her hold on England. So all of this was happening in the time that Edmund Campion was going to school and living his life. Well, Queen Elizabeth actually met Edmund Campion while he was at Oxford, and she was very impressed by him. And as a result, Campion was offered her patronage. Several of her high friends in court offered the support of the crown, and many of her high-ranking friends became friends with Campion himself. And Edmund saw this as an opportunity to further his rise to glory and power and riches that he was already working at, but with this newfound friendship of the queen would be even easier. And so as a, as a result, Edmund actually recanted his Catholic faith. He left the Catholic Church. He swore an oath of submission to the Queen, and he became an Anglican. Edmund was even ordained an Anglican deacon, so he was getting very involved with the Church of England, and he abandoned his Catholic faith for a time. But as time went on, Edmund began to have 
doubts about his decision. He began to doubt that the Anglican Church was true, doubting his decision to leave the faith. And these doubts wouldn't go away. They persisted. They gave him no peace. And he continued to question Anglicanism to the effect that it actually raised some suspicion at the university. And so he left the university and he went to what was a very highly Catholic territory in Ireland to study further. And it was while he was there that he realized that he had made a mistake in becoming an Anglican and he reverted back to Catholicism. He became a Catholic once again and he returned to the true faith. It was around this time too that Edmund began to hear the call to become a priest, particularly with the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits. He began to feel this call from the Lord to become a priest with the Jesuits. But the persecution of Catholics continued to get worse in England. And so Edmund escaped to France, actually, to study for the priesthood there at an English-speaking seminary. So while he was there in France, he studied, and eventually he was ordained a priest with the Society of Jesus in Prague. So Edmund went on this secret mission to become a priest, and yet he didn't want to stay away from England forever. He felt this call to return, to return to his homeland, to return to the people that he had left behind there in order to minister to the Catholics who were still being persecuted in England, who were still facing suffering for not swearing submission to the Queen of England as the ruler of the church. And so he wanted to return to England to minister to the Catholics there, even though he knew that to do so was illegal, that if he was caught as a Catholic priest there ministering the sacraments, that it was an offense that could be punishable by death. And yet Edmund felt this call. And so with some other Jesuit priests, he returned in secret to England. He sailed to England and he came disguised as a jewel merchant. That was his fake persona that he came with. He dressed as a jewel merchant in order to avoid suspicion. And then he used several other uh, costumes and disguises to keep his true identity as a Catholic priest a secret from those who were searching for him. And what he began to do is to travel around England and celebrating the sacraments secretly. So he would celebrate mass, he would hear confessions, he would catechize, and then he would quickly move on to a new location so that he wouldn't be caught by the authorities that were hunting him. And they hunted him all over England, but he kept eluding them. Now, Edmund knew that his time was running out, that even though he had escaped, he figured that he would probably get arrested at some point and would be tried for his work as a Catholic priest. And so he wrote down what has become famously known as Campion's Brag, and it's kind of his manifesto. He explains his whole mission about why he came to England, and he writes it to the Queen, he writes it to all the authorities that are hunting him as a declaration of what he's all about, just so that he would have the last word and so that they would understand his mission. And it's too long to read, but I'll read a little portion of it just so that you can get a sense of what Edmund was like, his fiery personality, his boldness. He writes, I have come out of Germany, sent by my superiors, and adventured myself into this noble realm, my dear country, for the glory of God and the benefit of souls. I do now lay into your hands a plain confession that you may know directly, truly, and resolutely my full enterprise and purpose. So he's saying, I've come into this mission I've come into England for the glory of God, and he's going to tell them now why he does what he does. He says, I confess that I am a priest of the Catholic Church in the Society of Jesus, and my charge is free of cost to preach the gospel, to minister the sacraments, to instruct the simple, to reform sinners and to confute errors, in brief, to cry spiritual alarm against foul vice and proud ignorance, wherewith many of my dear countrymen are abused. He's saying, my mission is to come and to preach the gospel, to give the sacraments to people, to refute the errors that are attacking the true faith, and to cry alarm for all the spiritual abuse that is happening to my people in my country. He doesn't stand for it, and he says, this is why I've come, 
to serve the people here as a Catholic priest. So these bold words, they fired Catholics up. They increased their zeal. Maybe some Catholics who were wavering in their faith under the persecution, they were thinking to themselves, maybe I'll just become an Anglican and just escape this persecution just for the convenience of it. These words fired them up and helped them remain true to the true faith. But it also made the queen's men furious. His words made them furious and they sought him all the more. They tried to arrest him all the more. But his work was not just to help Catholics, but he also worked to convert Anglicans back to the true faith. So he strengthened the faith of Catholics, but he also tried to find new and inventive means that were also very daring to bring them back to the true faith. And one of the most famous examples of this is that Edmund Campion published a pamphlet, which he called 10 Reasons. And he gave 10 reasons he explained in this pamphlet why Catholicism was the true faith over Anglicanism. And he printed off a bunch of these pamphlets using a secret printing press. Because again, if the authorities would have found this printing press, they would have arrested and probably killed all those who were making these pamphlets. So then he took these pamphlets and he had them smuggled in to the University of Oxford and he placed them in the pews of the church just in time for the commencement. So at the time of the commencement, when everyone filed into the church, they sat down in their pews and they found his 10 reasons pamphlet and he started reading them. People started to learn more about why the Catholic faith was the true one. And it was a huge publicity stunt. People were talking about it all over the place and it infuriated the English authorities all the more. And they tried to catch him even more. And finally they did. Finally, they did catch him. Because Edmund Campion was betrayed by a spy, a spy who had taken a bribe to sell him out. So Edmund Campion was arrested. He was brought in a shameful parade into London. So they rode him into London riding backwards on a horse. They put a sign on his head that called him a traitor. And he was mocked by the crowd. Finally, they had caught the man that they had been looking for for so long, this notorious Catholic priest who had done so much to build up the Catholic faith and undermine the Anglican hold on the country. And Edmund was taken and imprisoned in the infamous Tower of London. And there he was pressured to recant his own faith, to leave the Catholic faith, to put the Queen of England as his sole authority instead of the Pope. But he also was pressured to betray the hiding place of other Catholics, other influential Catholics, other priests. And when he wouldn't do this because of their pressure, they began to torture him. And they tortured him cruelly in order to get him to leave his faith, but also to betray his fellow Catholics. And they tortured him in several different ways. One of them is they put him in an infamous cell that they called Little Ease. And it was called Little Ease for this reason. The cell was built to be about four feet tall but also the floor was only four feet long. And so this meant that a grown adult put into this cell would not be able to properly stand up because it was so short, but also wouldn't be able to lie down. And so the person was always in discomfort, always bent and hobbled, which is why the tower cell was called little ease because the prisoner would have little ease while they were in there. And prisoners would be left in there for a long period of time so that by the time they were let out, their body had become twisted and malformed from being in such a cramped position. And Edmund Campion was kept in this dark cell for four days straight. He was never able to walk properly again. His back and, and his joints were twisted from being put into this cell. And this is how they tortured him. They also stretched him out on the rack. The rack was a torture device that was very popular back then. And this would be a machine where the prisoner would be attached by his arms and his legs, and then the rack would be stretched. It would be turned so that his body would be pulled gradually until his joints were dislocated. The muscles began to tear. It was very painful, and the joints would actually begin to pop and crack as they came out of joint from him being stretched so far. And this happened to him many times. After he had been tortured, and in fact, while he was still being tortured, 
he was brought before a panel of Anglican scholars for theological debate. And the idea with this debate was that they would have this public debate where Edmund Campion would be publicly shamed in front of a crowd to show them once and for all that the Anglican faith was the true one and the Catholic faith was wrong. So Edmund Campion was brought still in this weak state from being tortured and was brought before this theological panel of Anglican scholars. And even though he had no notes, and even though he wasn't even permitted to sit, he had no table to lean on, he soundly defeated all of them. He defeated all of them. He answered all of their arguments and he defended the faith. And he did so in such a heroic way that the crowd who was watching him, even though that they were Anglicans themselves, they cheered for him. They began to root for him. It brought about conversions in the crowd and he thoroughly embarrassed the Anglican scholars who were watching him. And so as a result, they didn't really know what to do with him. And so they decided that all of his future sessions would be carried out privately so that he would not be able to reach the crowd as he had earlier. Eventually, he was brought in and tried for treason before a court. Edmund pleaded not guilty. He said, I'm not guilty of treason. I love the queen. I love my country, but my Catholic faith comes first. But when he pleaded not guilty, because he had been so cruelly tortured, he couldn't raise his hand. His arm wasn't working properly because he had been racked so often and a fellow prisoner had to raise it for him. So he really suffered for the faith, but he was heroically standing there and saying, I'm a Catholic first. I stand for my faith. The court was a sham court. They brought in all this false evidence. They lied about him. They told rumors about him to the public in order to uh, abuse him and make him lose face there. But he defended himself as well as he could. He professed loyalty to the queen. He professed to be a good Englishman, but he refused to acknowledge the queen to be the head of the church. And he stood loyally with the Pope. And as a result, they condemned him of treason and they condemned him to death. His penalty was to be hung, drawn, and quartered. And we actually have a testimony of the person who condemned him to death. We know what was said. And, and when Edmund was condemned of treason, this was the ruling of the court that they read to him. They said, you shall be drawn through the open city of London upon hurdles to the place of execution. And there you shall be hanged and let down alive and your parts cut off and your entrails taken out and burnt in your sight. And then your head is to be cut off and your body divided into four parts to be disposed of Her Majesty's pleasure. So this horribly graphic sentence was read out to him, and yet Edmund's response was heroic. He began to sing praises to God in the courtroom, praises that he had been found worthy to suffer for his faith and endure this horrible death of being hung, drawn, and quartered. As he was dragged to the place of execution, he saluted a statue of Mary that was still in a gate that he had to pass through. So even though he was strapped to a hurdle and he was dragged through the streets and people were mocking him and throwing things at him and spitting on him, he still pushed himself up as much as possible to salute Our Lady as he was passing through. So such great devotion and heroism for him. As he was led to the scaffold, he was mocked by the people, but he prayed for his executioners. He prayed for the queen. He prayed for England that his country would come back to the true faith. And he professed again that he was not a traitor, but that he loved God above all else. And then they performed the sentence. He was hung, drawn, and quartered, which meant he was hung first, but they took him down while he was still alive. So this was to choke him. They took him down and they cut him open and they pulled out his entrails, his intestines, while he was still living, and they burned them in front of him. And then they finally put him out of his misery by cutting off his head. And his body was divided. That was where the quartering happened and was distributed to different parts of London as a warning to other Catholics about what would happen if they dared to defy the queen and her orders. So this horrible death, and yet Edmund endured it with great heroism for the sake of the faith.
As a result of the holiness of his life and his martyrdom, he was canonized by Pope St. Paul VI in 1970. So he hasn't been canonized a saint for that long. But the life of Edmund Campion has seriously inspired me. I love St. Edmund Campion. I have a deep devotion to him. I talk to him often. I ask for his intercession. And I'm especially inspired by his boldness, his daring, you know, his inventive means of spreading the gospel. I want to be like him in that. And I'm also inspired by his willingness to suffer such a horrible death for love of his people for love of his country and his refusal to leave the faith despite so many pressures, that he was willing to give up the life of riches and wealth that he could have had in order to follow God's call. So what can we learn from St. Edmund Campion? I think we can learn a pretty important lesson, and that is that the Christian life is meant to be lived boldly. We need to be aggressive. We need to be bold in living out our faith. The world is getting darker and darker. In many parts of our culture, we can see a sickness and an evil that is becoming very prevalent. And the light of Christianity is supposed to be in direct conflict with this. We're not supposed to just fade away. We're supposed to shine brightly in the midst of the dark world that we find ourselves in. And this can be hard for us because the tendency for us as Christians is to try to be nice to people, to, to try to be nice at all costs. But really, Edmund Campion wasn't nice. He wasn't a nice man. He was a bold man. He was a good man. He was a heroic man. He was totally sold out for Jesus. And as a result, he made enemies. He made enemies and he was constantly outsmarting them and outsmarting the evil forces that were present in his country in order to spread the gospel. Edmund Campion wasn't content to just sit back and let evil and lies spread uninhibited. He needed to take a bold stand for Jesus and the faith. And that's something that we can learn as well, that we're not called to be nice. We're called to be authentic Christians, that we're in charity and love, but with great zeal called to go and make a difference in the world and to share the light of Jesus in the face of the darkness. And to think of creative ways to do it, just like Edmund Campion did. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 in the Bible, Jesus tells his disciples to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. That means be wise as serpents. Serpents are always a symbol of evil. You know, Satan was represented by a serpent in the Garden of Eden. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, be wise as your enemy, be wise as the devil, but be innocent as doves. And I think said St. Edmund Campion is a really good example of that, that he used creative and ingenious tactics to outsmart the evil in his country in order to proclaim the gospel. So let us ask for St. Edmund's intercession. We've reached the end of our time, but let's pray for his intercession so that we can follow his example and be bold Catholics, bold defenders of the faith in order to become saints ourselves. So let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Edmund Campion, we want to seek your intercession today. We want to look to you as our model of holiness that like you, we will always be close to the true faith. And yet if we wander like you did for a while away from the faith, we ask for the grace to come back, to never be far from the Catholic church. We ask Edmund that you would give us a spiritual boldness and zeal like you had for the gospel. That like you, St. Edmund Campion, we would be creative in our methods to evangelize so that like you, we can be innocent as doves and wise as serpents. St. Edmund Campion, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.